just an ordinary small people who will not be able to see good for them, only in the worst that Mangas follow you. And you have come to guide us, men. So man has ever, ever been of age. Man has ever been behaving like adults. And this is what Iqbal has totally missed to notice that man is progressing forward and at every cross section the man which is found in time is the most advanced. We are advanced, of course, in relative to the previous times. <coughs> but the man of tomorrow will be far more advanced than we are and he would be, look, he would be looking back at us as not adults and he would assume himself to be the adult man. Man who has come of age, who is mature. Some scientists project into future and, and have, have uh, um, you know, suggested that possibly in the next few hundred years the science could have achieved such deeper knowledge of things, uh, of, of the nature of, of things, that the man of that age will look back at us. As we are looking back, back at a man of 5,000 years ago. Because the speed of progress is uh, hastening up. It is accelerating. So the man who has left behind 5,000 years, in 5,000 years, it would not be required for the future man to leave us 5,000 years behind in 5,000 years. He can leave behind 5,000 years in only 100 years. You know, that is the sort of logic he has created. And although it's a bit difficult for common man to understand, but this is correct. But things are speeding up so fast, so rapidly, that uh, the time scale has changed. Man of yesteryear, in reality, can be left hundreds of years behind, comparing, judging from the time scale of the previous days, of the previous ages. So, what talk of what is this talk of maturity of man? Man of every age has considered himself to be mature enough to, to see his right from wrong. And that has always been his attitude towards prophets and worldly lights. Secondly, when Iqbal says that, it is not Iqbal, it is Nietzsche who is speaking in him. Nietzsche was a German philosopher by whom Iqbal was most deeply impressed. And he creates a man of his own in the name of Mother Woman, as was created by Nietzsche in the name of Mother Sabra. And the features are almost the same features. Now Nietzsche has raised this argument against the existence of God. He said a sort he says a sort of God was required by previous people because they were not mature enough. Some higher authority was sought to give them direction. And so the concept of a super being was invented, was created by mankind to guide the people who are those great ages. Now we have come of age, says Nietzsche. Now we can see right from the wrong. So no God is required. So not only the institution of prophethood, but also the institution of God who is now on the board with the same argument. Secondly, and I mean among so many things which Iqbal has uh, philosophized by, for the sake of rejecting prophets, he, he has come out with a very different idea again. He says that uh, it is the greatest blessing of the holy prophet of Islam and this is one of his most distinctive features that he has saved us from future trials. You know, previously, whenever a prophet came, people were put to such great trial of either accepting him or rejecting him. 
So if they accepted him, well and good. But if they rejected, imagine, they would be cursed and they would be annihilated and destroyed and you know, they would be doomed forever. So what the Holy Prophet of Islam has done is that he has saved us from that trial once and for all. No more trials. No more trial of acceptance or rejection. So mankind will never be doomed again as it was it was wrong to be doomed in, in the time of previous prophets. Now if it is a blessing to save mankind from this trial of acceptance or rejection, why this blessing was not shown by Allah at the, at the first uh, instead of um, 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 I mean, uh, when the first time he sent a prophet in the name of Adam, why couldn't Allah see that? That by creating the institution of prophet, he is putting poor mankind into such big, uh, put into such trials, and the majority of them will be cursed because of their rejection. So Allah, having seen the first experiment fail, repeated the same mis mistake the second time, sent another prophet. Again he was rejected and the poor majority of mankind was cursed. And still Allah couldn't see light. A third was sent again and a fourth was raised. He had to repeat this experiment in futility 124,000 times before he began to see light. He said, all right, enough is enough. <laughs> enough is enough. So now I must save mankind from this trial as well. From now on, and the posterity after the time of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not be tried. How stupid it is. He does not understand the ABC of the religious phenomena and religious phenomena. The fact is that according to the Holy Quran, that which he considers a curse is a blessing of prophethood. The Holy Quran tells us, Ma Allah would not let the believers be alone until He separates the wicked from the good. This trial continues even after people have accepted Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what it is to understand. The fact is that the first trial of coming of the Prophet is not a trial in that sense. It is a sifting, a process of sifting, right from the wrong. And if faith is mixed with the with goodness, with purity, and somebody begins to separate the faith, can any sane man object against it by telling him, look here, can't you understand that faith is much more than the purity? When you separate the faith, you will be rejecting the majority. In favor of a very small minority of four things. So why are you destroying all this? Leave it alone. Let the faith remain mixed up with the goodness, with the purity. Is that the right attitude? Of course it is wrong.